And hello, Seishim Library, and thank you, Ali, for inviting me, and thank you, Anne-Marie, for uh, being so nice to me over the past year. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the fourth talk I'm doing for the library, and this one is about the Super Bowl and things you might not know about the Super Bowl. After all, the Super Bowl was made possible by an act of Congress in 1966. Uh, that is me in 1982. That's Pace University up in Westchester County, where the New York Giants used to have uh, their training camp. And that is me discussing something with Phil Sims, probably Phil more interested eating that banana than talking to me because uh, I was imposing on his lunchtime by asking him some question about the 1982 season. But Phil Sims was an MVP of the Super Bowl the year the Giants beat Denver in 1987. The Super Bowl, well, it was created after the United States Congress, both the House and Senate, passed legislation allowing the merger of the American Football League and the National Football League. The merger was tacked on to an anti-inflation bill signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson on November 8, 1966. Super Bowl is a big event. It is a huge event in the United States, and because of that, there is a phalanx of security surrounding the game led by the United States Secret Service. It's a Seer One level event. The Super Bowl is a special events assessment rating level one event. There are 50 agencies that work about a year and a half to make sure that the event is secure. Now, this year's Super Bowl is scheduled for February 7th in Tampa, COVID allowing it because of the COVID outbreak. Uh, a lot of the problems in sports uh, since the COVID outbreak in March of 2020. Uh, but uh, the uh, security has been in Tampa since September of uh, 2019. In fact, they haven't left Florida because last year's Super Bowl was in Florida. So security has been in Florida since September of uh, 2018, first in Miami for uh, last February Super Bowl and this year. Uh, the National Football League doesn't pay any money into the Super Bowl security. Uh, that comes from taxpayers and uh, the agencies that are involved. Some of the agencies involve the FBI, FEMA, TSA, the Customs and Border Patrol, and local police, all part of the security team. Uh, in 1964, the American Football League had eight teams. Uh, the New York Jets, one of those eight teams back then. The National Football League had 14 teams, of course, the New York Giants being part of that. Uh, both teams were looking to expand. The National Football League beats the American Football League into Atlanta for a 15th team, and the uh, American Football League is looking for a ninth team. And they decide, you know what? New Orleans might not be a bad spot for a team. In fact, uh, David Dixon wants a team down there. David Dixon would uh, go on to uh, be the founder of the United States Football League, which started in 1983 and lasted uh, three seasons. Uh, he and other business leaders in New Orleans convinced the American Football League that, come down here. It'll be a great city for you. You need another team. They got 15. You could have nine now. And uh, hey, Jim Crow is done. Civil Rights Act has been signed into law by uh, Lyndon Johnson, and there won't be any problems here. Well, David Dixon, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men sometimes go awry. Well, this one did. Uh, that picture you see is at the New Orleans airport, and it is a number of American Football League players, Curtis McClinton looking uh, straight ahead uh, at uh, the ticket agent probably, and uh, Earl Faison and Butch uh, Bird. Um, there were 22 African American players selected to play in the New Orleans All-Star Game, and New Orleans was supposed to greet the players with open arms, and they were going to get an American Football League team. Well, again, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Quick background here, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Jim Crow, New Orleans, players boycott, Senator Russell Long, Representative Hale Boggs, Representative Emanuel Seller were all part of the Super Bowl creation, mostly by accident, some a little bit by design. 
Ron Mix was a player with the San Diego Chargers back in the 1960s. He's a mer uh, member of the National Football League, or actually the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. And uh, in 2014, Ron Mix and I, uh, who I knew uh, since 1997, Ron Mix and I got into a conversation about the Los Angeles Clippers in the National Basketball Association and how that team's players were threatening to strike because the owner of that team, Donald Sterling, had sent some disparaging remarks about African Americans. Uh, and I asked Ron because he was part of the 1965 American Football League All-Star Game boycott to compare the situations, and they really weren't compatible. But Ron Mix said that both of them at least were fighting for the right cause. Um, we were aware that New Orleans was hosting the game to demonstrate to the American Football League and the National Football League that they, New Orleans, could support a football franchise. The last thing we wanted to do was a system in demonstrating they could support a franchise. A boycott was the only alternative for the players. Now, this wasn't the first ever football boycott in New Orleans. Go back to 1961, and that guy on uh, the screen, Walter Beach, shown here in his Cleveland Browns uniform, was a member of the American Football League's Boston Patriots. Uh, he was a young guy. He was a defensive back at the time, and uh, he was fired by the Boston Patriots of the American Football League and labeled a troublemaker because he organized a protest among the black players uh, who were talking about how it was awful being segregated during a team's road trip to New Orleans in the preseason in 1961. An exhibition game was supposed to be played in New Orleans. Uh, Beach said he wanted to be treated like the white players were treated, stay at the same hotels, eat at the same restaurants, and he couldn't. Those were the days of the Green Book. I'm sure you got the Green Book movie or the Green Book uh, in the library or can get the Green Book in the library. It was put out from about 1935 to about 1966, and it was given to African Americans, Negroes, colored people, uh, where they could go to get gas, where they could eat, where they could stay at a hotel. And Walter Beach was protesting all of that. And for that, he got fired. Now, fast forward about three and a half years later, the players come to New Orleans, they get to the hotel, rather to the airport, and they find out that they can't take a cab by themselves. Now, if they had a white guy saying, this guy is with me, they could go in a cab. But by themselves, they could not get a cab ride. Cookie Gilchrist, who was a running back with the Buffalo Bills, was able to get a cab ride because he was with Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp, who ran for vice president, or as he told me one time, he said, you know, I wanted to be vice president and run for vice president in the worst way, and I did. He lost in 1996. Uh, Bob Dole was the Republican uh, presidential nominee, Kemp the vice presidential nominee, and they lost to Bill Clinton and Al Gore. Gilchrist uh, was lucky. He got a cab ride into New Orleans to stay at the Roosevelt Hotel or the Fountain Blue Hotel. Um, why New Orleans? Well, they wanted a football team. The American Football League wanted to give out another football team. No segregation anymore, right? No Jim Crow. City wants a football team. The American Football League at that time, at that time, was the only league to truly embrace African-American athletes as an equal on the field with white players. Baseball, yeah, they kind of, but not really. There were problems with Jim Crow in the South and in some towns. Um, basketball, not quite yet. Hockey, because it was an all-Canadian game, there was uh, one African-Canadian player, Willie O'Ree, played with the Boston Bruins in 1959. But the American Football League needed players when it started in 1959, and they were going to get players for wherever they could, whether it was the Canadian Football League, college, or the traditional black schools, and they got a lot of players out of the traditional black schools. The NFL scouts went to watch players from the big-time schools and conferences. The AFL looked for players with a different background, whether it was Grambling University, Bethune-Cookman, Prairie View, Morgan State. That is where the players were, and they found players there. 
The Civil Rights Act, which was signed into law by Lyndon Johnson in 1964, July of 1964, ironically, it destroyed the black college football programs because now the best players could attend the big schools, whether it's Alabama, uh, Ole Miss, uh, Texas, Georgia, South Carolina, Florida. Um, that opened the doors for the athletes to go to the big time schools. Abner Haynes, who's now in his 80s, who lives in uh, Dallas and uh, is a, a buddy of mine. Uh, Abner Haynes told me a couple of stories about uh, the 1965 New Orleans experience. One of them was getting to the hotel. Now, uh, he was told by his owner, Lamar Hunt, uh, in Kansas City, the uh, Kansas City Chiefs owner, Abner, name, rank, and serial number. Abner Haynes, running back Kansas City Chiefs, member of the American Football League All-Star team. That's all you need to know. Uh, eventually, after a three-hour wait, uh, cabs came to pick up the players, uh, colored cabs as they were called, because uh, there was some negotiation between the American Football League, the governor of Louisiana, the mayor of New Orleans, and they sent cabs out to get to the rest of the players. So the players do get in their cabs eventually after waiting three and a half hours. And uh, he gets to the uh, Hotel Roosevelt. And he says he has no problem uh, at the desk signing in. Okay, that's fine. We got into the hotel. We're great. It's him and David Grace and his teammate. And they get to the elevator. It's one of these old hand-cranked elevators uh, where somebody would sit in a chair and uh, control the crank. And there was a gate, and they opened the gate. And the doors would swing wide open. Abner and David are standing there. The doors swing open, and there's an elderly woman who's sitting in the chair. She's the elevator operator, and she says, what are you two monkeys doing here? Abner Haynes, Kansas City Chiefs running back, member of the American Football League All-Star Team. David Grayson, defensive back, Kansas City Chiefs, member of the American Football League All-Star Team. Okay, monkeys get in the back. This is what Haynes told me. They had a woman operating the elevator, and she said, you monkeys, come on in and get to the back. Finally, we had about 10 or 12 guys in my room. We were talking sensibly. We were going to stay together. This was just another test. Abner Haynes was the first African-American player to play college football on a regular basis in Texas at Northern Texas University in 1956. Uh, he was the captain of the Dallas Texans, the predecessor of the Kansas City Chiefs. That was in 1961 as a second year player. He knew all about Jim Crow in the South. And uh, this is why he said this was just another test. As far as the players said, he said, we had no leverage. We weren't playing for money, but we were playing for progress. The football players took the lead. I stopped him right there. I said, uh, there were other demonstrations in the South. And he said, but we took the lead in football. And what they did, literally, these players, 22 of them, put their necks on the line because they could have been fired immediately for striking, if that's what they did. Places like Atlanta, New Orleans, and Miami were death holes. Dave Grayson couldn't get a drink at the bar. Our white teammates in New Orleans were there for us. And uh, there is me in 1979, all of 23 years old, interviewing Jack Kemp, who at that point was a congressman from Western New York. And when I said players put their careers on the line, Jack Kemp also, not only did he put his career on the line, he was the president of the American Football League Players Association, not only did he put his career on the line football-wise, but he put his political career on the line as well, supporting his teammates. Uh, Jack Kemp in 1964 uh, was campaigning for Barry Goldwater in Western New York while he was the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills. So uh, this was a double shot at losing your career for Kemp because he wanted to go into politics um, as a football player and then as a politician. And uh, Jack looked at that picture and he said, what happened to your hair? And I said, what happened to your wig? And in 2003, he had a different wig. So that's him and my son in 2003. Jack and I had about a 30-year relationship where we went back and forth talking about politics and also sports. 
Uh, Abner continued, one of the things we, the AFL, needed was the unity of the white and black players for a new league. When the white players, Jack Kemp, Jerry Mays, who was our Kansas City defensive leader, and four or five other guys, heard about what was happening, their characters showed that my teammates were looking after me. The boycott. The boycott takes place over a 36-hour period. Uh, Ernie Ladd, who played with the San Diego Chargers, who was six foot nine, weighed 315 pounds, um, went on to a career as a professional wrestler, decided he was going to go uh, onto, uh, into a bar on Bourbon Street along with Earl Faison. And um, the bouncer at the door, who was not a very big guy, looked at him and he said, uh, I wouldn't go in there. And he said, I'm going in there. I'm going in. Ernie Ladd had gone to Grambling University in Louisiana. The guy said, I wouldn't go in if I were you. And he says, no, I'm going in. And then the guy took out his gun, showed it to Ernie Ladd, and Ernie left. Um, there were a lot of stories like that, a lot of name calling, you know, what are you doing here, all that type of thing. Players meet. Kemp says, we got your back. Um, the player said, we're not playing. Jack calls Bud Adams. The Houston Oilers owner says, the guys aren't going to play. And quickly, the American Football League moved that game to Houston. It was all in the space of 36 hours. There's no uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or Ralph Abernathy or SNCC uh, or the Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference. None of those people are involved. This is strictly these football players who did it. New Orleans, all of a sudden, it's on the outside looking in. Eventually, New Orleans would become a political pawn. The Super Bowl would rise out of the ashes of the New Orleans boycott. The American Football League and the National Football League announced a plan to merge on June 8, 1966. But you just can't announce a plan to merge, and it happens. There are antitrust laws that uh, govern the country and businesses. And uh, you just cannot um, say we're merged, we're one, without Congress uh, approving it. The two entities needed an antitrust exemption from Congress, which brings in this guy here, and there is me back in 1986, at this Foley Square, Southern District Court of New York, uh, where the United States Football League and the National Football League are battling over an antitrust suit which the USFL, USFL would win, but they only got $3 and it would force them out of business. Anyway, there is me with the tie and the commissioner of the National Football League by this point, rather uh, 26 years into his reign as the commissioner of the NFL, Pete Rozelle. Rozelle has to go to Washington to get this done. Now, a sports commissioner is a hardened political lobbyist. And Roselle was an old hand on Capitol Hill by the summer of 1966, after all. He had to go there in 1961 to get a television antitrust exemption. Uh, he lobbied the House and Brooklyn Democrat, Emanuel Seller, who I think started his career, War of 1812 broke out, uh, in an attempt to win a limited antitrust exemption so the National Football League could sell the league's 14 franchises as one to a television network. Seller got the bill through the House in two days, one up to the Senate. Estes Kefauer got it through the Senate in one day, and John F. Kennedy signed the legislation into law on September 30th, 1961. And that makes the NFL a whole, because all the teams in the NFL, 14 in those days, uh, would split television money equally, and all teams would be equal uh, because of television. The law helped propel the NFL into a different economic orbit. So Emmanuel Seller is important to the National Football League, and you don't want to cross him. Meanwhile, there's Lyndon Johnson and Russell Long. Johnson on the right, Long on the left. Long was the uh, fifth-ranked Democrat in terms of power uh, in the Senate at that point. The uh, Democrats held the uh, Senate at that point. But uh, he wasn't too happy with this uh, merger deal, nor was uh, Hale Boggs, uh, Cookie Roberts' father, who was a congressman from Louisiana, 
neither saw a benefit to New Orleans because they weren't getting a team. In fact, um, the American Football League abandoned the opportunity to go there and the National Football League watching and saw what happened uh, in New Orleans wasn't too interested uh, in the market. Uh, maybe give it a couple of years, maybe some things will change and maybe we'll go in there. Uh, but getting long support, because if you got his support, you got both senators uh, in Louisiana and, and also probably Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, Arkansas, um, and Tennessee. Uh, and you need that, and you probably needed bot support to get those House members on board with a merger. So Roselle is um, between um, a rock and a hard place here. He wants the merger, but he can't get it without guaranteeing New Orleans a team. Eventually, he would go back to his owners and say, this is the deal. And the owners would say, of course, give them a team. But there were other complications here, getting a team into New Orleans. Uh, I don't know how many of you long-suffering Jets fans are watching this today, but uh, at one time, the New York Jets football team was a hot property. Uh, in 1966, because of Joe Namath, and uh, they were building a team at that point with Matt Snell and, uh, and a whole bunch of people on defense. But Namath was the centerpiece. And one of the proposals the NFL had to make sure there would be 24 teams, 15 National Football League teams, nine American Football League teams, there would be 24 teams in 24 cities, which meant that some teams would have to move around because they only wanted one team per city. One of the problems is Emmanuel Seller and the New York Jets. Uh, here is what the compromise was to satisfy Louisiana interests initially. Namath and the Jets would move to Los Angeles. Daniel Reeves would take his Los Angeles franchise to San Diego, and they would uh, replace, Reeves' team would replace the San Diego Chargers. The Chargers would pick up and moved to New Orleans because Baron Hilton, the owner of the Chargers, had business interests in New Orleans, and uh, they'll figure out what to do with Oakland eventually. They could move the Oakland Raiders franchise to either Seattle or to Portland. But Emmanuel Seller wasn't going to have any of this. Now, Seller uh, and, and Roselle did work together in 1961, the Subcommittee on Antitrust, uh, which was Seller's committee, uh, he assured Seller that uh, if you give me your vote, no team would move, be moved because of the merger. Um, that's the only way he was going to able to placate Seller, who was in Brooklyn, and a lot of Seller's people, his constituency. Well, New York Giants games, they were sold out. Uh, they were sold out since the uh, late 1950s. You were on the waiting list, but you were not on the waiting list to see Jets games. And there were a lot of people from Brooklyn who could take the train or the subway over to the 7 train to get to Shea Stadium real easy. And there was a lot of parking at Shea Stadium. So Seller knew that um, maybe it wouldn't be a good idea for the New York Jets franchise owned by David Sonny, as in Money World One, should leave the market. And uh, San Francisco and Oakland had a similar situation. But uh, Roselle said, okay, through 1970, we'll keep all the teams where they were. Uh, New Orleans would get a team. By the way, why 1970? Because the NFL wanted all of its teams to have over 50,000 seats in its stadiums. Chicago and Minnesota did not meet that requirement, but nobody was moving the Chicago Bears out of Chicago. Uh, Minnesota was started to look for a new stadium in the mid-1970s. New Orleans, and this is from uh, the last Mardi Gras that uh, people actually attend. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. There was a Mardi Gras in 2020. This is uh, from the 2019 Mardi Gras where New Orleans fans thought uh, referees cheated them out of going to the Super Bowl. Screw that. Hot nuts. That's the crew. The deal. Roselle and the NFL owners relented. They worked out a deal with Hale Boggs, included placing a team in New Orleans. Congress approved the uh, NFL-AFL merger by giving the two competitors an antitrust exemption, which was added as a rider to an anti-inflation tax bill on October 21st, 1966. What senator was going to vote for inflation? <laughs> 
they put that on an easy bill and there was hell Boggs. The deal was with Boggs, uh, 10 days after you pass the bills, we'll give you a team, but 10 days would be Halloween. That didn't make sense to announce the team on Halloween. So they waited the day to November 1st, All Saints Day. New Orleans got a team on All Saints Day. And Johnson officially signed the merger bill into law on November 8th, 1966. And there is the pen he used, Public Law 89-800, uh, which uh, allowed the formation of the Super Bowl. Oh, the NFL owners made some money off of this. Of course, they always do. The league pocketed $8 million. That was the expansion fee from New Orleans, divided by 15 owners, which meant that uh, each owner got about oh, $475,000, which was a lot of money in 1966. New York Jets ownership, David, Sonny, as in money, war one, had to really pay up $10 million because the Jets franchise invaded the New York Giants territory, even though World One didn't start the team. Harry Wismer started the team in 1960. World One said no to the merger. He wanted to stay on his own. Uh, the Oakland Raiders in the San Francisco Bay Area handed over $8 million to the San Francisco 49ers because they too, or the football team, also invaded an NFL territory. The two AFL dissents, in the nine-team league, it was 7-2 for the merger. The Jets and Raiders said no. The AFL decided to uh, add a 10th team for the 1968 season, uh, and that would go to Cincinnati, $7.5 million. All would go to the 16 teams in the NFL, another $450,000. So the owners made over $900,000 in this business transaction uh, in the National Football League. Uh, the Mara family picked up uh, almost $11 million, and the San Francisco 49ers ownership almost $9 million in this. The uh, Super Bowl starts January 15, 1967, and there is Vince Lombardi, who never won the Lombardi Trophy, who won the first uh, two Super Bowls. In fact, theoretically, Vince Lombardi never coached in the Super Bowl. It was called the American Football League, National Football League World Championship game until 1969. So in 1967 and 68, Vince Lombardi didn't win the Lombardi Trophy, nor did he coach a team in the Super Bowl. Uh, Mickey Mouse, I don't know, Mickey Mouse, uh, not today so much, but for a long time when I was growing up and into my 20s, into my 30s, uh, into the 1980s, I always heard the expression, well, that's a Mickey Mouse thing. That's a Mickey Mouse thing. That's a Mickey Mouse thing, which meant it wasn't a good thing. Last time there was a hostile takeover of Disney, the uh, house the mouse built, uh, Comcast was going to give $66 billion to take over Disney. $66 billion. I don't know about that mouse. I mean, that little rodent was worth a lot of money. Anyway, Green Bay and Kansas City played in the first American Football League National Football League Championship game, January 15th, 1967. Lombardi, the Green Bay coach, did not want to play the game as his team had already won the NFL championship, and he referred to the American Football League as a Mickey Mouse League. Empty seats in the first game, a lot of empty seats, two-thirds of the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum is filled, one third isn't, for the Packers and Chiefs game. Uh, 94,000 seats in the Coliseum, there were 33,000 empty seats, and the price, hey, you couldn't beat the price, even by 1967 dollars, $12, $10, six bucks, six bucks, six bucks to see what would become the Super Bowl. It was the last time that a Super Bowl or a world championship game in football, in professional football, in the National Football League, was not a sellout. But it was more than just a game. It was more than just a game because Lombardi was coaching for the pride of CBS and its founder, Bill Paley. CBS started in 1927. WCAU Radio in Philadelphia was Paley's first uh, media property. 
And uh, CBS and the National Football League had been aligned in many ways since the mid-1950s. Mickey Mouse. First game played January 15th, 1967, just 26 days after the final approval of the merger between the two leagues. CBS and NBC televised it using the same television feed, but different announcers and different advertisers. The CBS chairman, Bill Paley, leaned on Lombardi. He was coaching for CBS's pride. Tapes were expensive in those days, so expensive that neither AB, uh, rather uh, NBC or CBS bothered to tape the game. There are some bits and pieces of the game available, but the full game wasn't taped. It was wiped out, maybe for a game show, like Let's Make a Deal. Those tapes were wiped out too, as Monty Hall once said. We didn't keep tapes because tapes were expensive and then you had to store them. It didn't really cost that much money to store them. But uh, CBS and NBC, both networks erased the tape because they didn't think it was worthy. The tapes have not surfaced over the past 53 years. Jerry Kramer was a guard with the Green Bay Packers, Hall of Famer now, finally, after all these years. And uh, this is a 1988 interview that we did together. I was talking to Frank Gifford years ago, and he mentioned that he announced the first Super Bowl. Gifford said he was fairly cool, calm, and relaxed, and he went over to put his arm on Vince, Vince Lombardi's shoulder, and Lombardi was shaking like a leaf. When Lombardi was the assistant coach of the New York Giants in the 1950s, Frank Gifford was his favorite player, number 16, the Gifford. Gifford said, that really made me nervous. Gifford, of course, was the CBS announcer, and he represented the NFL. Meanwhile, NBC, David Sarnoff, gave Sonny Werblin $35 million over a five-year period to bring back to the American Football League owners, his fellow owners. Werblin said, here's the money. They signed the deal. Werblin took some of that money to sign Joe Namath to a three-year, $427,000 contract. By contrast, in 1964, when the contract was signed, the uh, quarterback of the NFL champion, Frank Ryan, Dr. Frank Ryan, made $13,000. Namath was making over 100000 a year. CBS and NBC charged $42,000 for a 30-second commercial. The two networks paid $9.5 million to televise the game. The leagues couldn't even agree on which ball to use. When Green Bay was on offense, they used the Wilson Duke, the Duke football named after the Giants owner, Wellington Merrick the Duke of Wellington. When Kansas City had the ball, they used the AFL-sanctioned Spalding J5V. And it wasn't just the footballs. It was Ford, the NFL sponsor, and also the owner of the Detroit Lions against Chrysler, CBS against NBC, NFL establishment sports writers like Sports Illustrated's Tex Mall against the uh, NBC AFL announcer Kirk Gowdy. Just wasn't a game. That would all subside. Tex Schramm, who ran the Dallas Cowboys and uh, was the guy who uh, gave the Dallas Cowboys the name America's team, uh, and was prone to a little hyperbole. Uh, some of what he said is true, like what I'm going to tell you here. Uh, the Super Bowl kind of put the icing on the cake, and interest in the National Football League kept rolling until it was the most popular spectator sport in the United States. Not quite true. First Super Bowl, 1967 first poll that showed that football eclipsed baseball uh, as the most popular sport in the United States, a 1965 Harris poll. And there is the Los Angeles Coliseum. It's me there in 1984. January 15, 1967 was when an American tradition was formed. Now, the name Super Bowl. Well, some people Al Davis, actually. Some people began calling the American Football League, National Football League, championship game, world championship game, the Super Bowl in 1968. Al Davis was running the Oakland Raiders after being the American Football League commissioner. He goes back to Oakland, and he refers to it as the Super Bowl. But it wasn't the official name at that point. No one could think of a proper NFL name, Pete Rozelle said. He thought that Lamar Hunt's idea of calling it the Super Bowl was corny. I haven't heard anybody use that term in a long time, but Pete Rozelle was born in 1926. I even discussed that with him back in the 1980s, and uh, I looked at him, I said, yeah, you are 60 years old. I was only 32 at the time. Corny. 
Anyway, uh, July 25th, 1966, Lamar Hunt sends a letter to the uh, commissioner of the National Football League, the Kansas City Chiefs owner. I have kiddingly called it the Super Bowl, which obviously can be approved upon. No, Lamar, it couldn't be. Lamar founded the American Football League in 1959 after failing to get an NFL team. And within seven years, he's naming this big game the Super Bowl. Well, the Super Bowl. It was one of the spur of the moment things, Hunt told me years ago, the late Lamar Hunt. No one ever said, what are we going to call it? It was one of those things that just came out of the mouth. It was not too inspired. Or was it? Was it inspired? Lamar might have been onto something here because one day he's home and he's watching his children, Clark and the others, play with a ball when he first uttered the words. They each had a Super Bowl. Oh, I remember the Super Bowl. I just started this all about, about, about all over the place. They had each had a Super Bowl that my wife had given to them. And they were always talking about them. And I just used the expression Super Bowl. It was an accidental thing. Super Bowl. Super Bowl. It was inspired. And there it is, the Super Bowl. I threw it all over the place. Bounced, chased it. The 10-year-old, he couldn't get better entertainment than I had in 1966. Mine was blue. The Whammo Super Bowl. What happened to the Whammo Super Bowl? Well, its shelf life was considerably less than the Super Bowl. Bowl. Super Bowl. It was a toy made of Zektron. Chemical engineer Norman Stingley found that when formed at 50,000 pounds of pressure, Zektron becomes uncontrollably bouncy. Whammo began producing a ball made of Zektron in 1964. Now, here's where, the, here's where it gets dicey. After only a few years, the double top secret formula for Zektron was copied by Whammo's competitors in the Super Bowl floundered. It floundered. It still bounced all over the place. Floundered. The Super Bowl was out of produ production by 1976. That is me, full head of hair in 1988. No gray either. And that is my friend Bruce Morton to uh, my left, Joe Namath's right. And uh, Weeb Eubank is behind Joe, the coach of the 1969 world champion New York Jets. Uh, this is the 20th, uh, 20th party thrown by the NFL alumni at the Wingfoot Golf Course in uh, Mamaroneck. And Joe uh, talking about what happened 20 years earlier. But Joe shouldn't be the central story of the Super Bowl and why the Super Bowl is important today because you got to remember a guy by the name of Lou Michaels. Lou Michaels was a kicker on the Baltimore Colts. The New York Jets and the Baltimore Colts would play in Super Bowl III, the first Super Bowl that's named on January 12, 1969 in Miami. And both teams get to the Miami area early and uh, players go out to relax at a bar in Fort Lauderdale. And it just so happened that uh, Lou Michaels and Joe Namath intersected at the same Fort Lauderdale bar. And this is the story not told about the Super Bowl because you gotta remember one thing. History is went, written by the victors. Lou Michaels was a three-time loser from Super Bowl III. I must say Joe is a very cocky individual. I never expected that from Joe. When he walked into the place, he had a fur coat on. I'll never forget it. A fur coat, Miami. And he points over to me instead of saying, hi, I'm Joe Namath. I thought he was going to introduce himself and say hello. He points over to me and he says, we're going to kick them out of you and I'm going to do it. This was not premeditated. Namath walked into the bar initially and he saw Lou Michaels whose brother, Walt Michaels, was the defensive coordinator of the New York Jets, and they looked alike. He walks out of the bar with Jim Hudson and then comes back in playing the role of well, maybe a professional wrestler or Muhammad Ali at that point. And there's that news conference on the beach where he tells the world he guarantees the Jets would win. And there is the uh, assorted uh, New York media listening to Joe, who's on the Chase Lounge. Salma, can you believe that's him? 
what guy are they? Some of that's, is it, it's not really you, Joe. It's really me. Oh, can I have you order Greg? Because the girls back in the Bronx are never going to believe this. <laughs> He's having, can you imagine today a quarterback sitting on the beach at Jay's Lounge with people just walking up to them, no security, nothing else, a guy in the back sitting on his Chase Lounge, not, not phased by this at all. And then you got uh, another person back there uh, on the Chase Lounge, also not phased. I mean, this, this was what the Super Bowl was in January of 1969. Wait until I tell the girls in the Bronx who I saw. Well, they didn't have to tell the girls. That picture was in Sports Illustrated, among other places. Namath makes the game important. The Jets-Colts game is the turning point. Namath guarantees the Jets would win. He delivers. Jets win 16-7. And because of Namath and the name change to Super Bowl III, the Super Bowl takes on a brand new life. Uh, the pregame show, a flimsy marching band, just the marching band. Uh, instead of having performers leading up to the national anthem, uh, the way they do today, maybe not this year, but the way they do today. The Apollo 8 astronauts who two weeks earlier had circled the moon uh, on Christmas Eve, Frank Borman, William Anders, and Jim Lovell, uh, led the crowd in Miami at the Orange Bowl in the Pledge of Allegiance. The national anthem was performed by a trumpet player by the name of Lloyd Geisler. The Florida a and marching band performed the halftime show. Lou Michaels lost in the bar. Lou Michaels lost on the field, and Lou Michaels lost a bet that he should have won, or kind of should have won. Uh, his brother Walt was a defensive coordinator with the Jets, and uh, they had a bet, Sawyersville, Pennsylvania. The Michaels were from Sawyersville. Uh, and uh, they decided, the brothers Michaels decided that they were going to uh, help fix up the church where they had been going since they were kids, and uh, as Lewis said, promised the Padre $5,000. Each team was going to get a base of $8,000 for being there, and the winner got $5,000 extra. And the two brothers agreed that $5,000 would go to the church. Uh, Walt Michaels uh, welched on his bet. And Lou Michaels, with his $8,000, took $5,000 out of the check to make good with the Padre. The brothers didn't talk for a while. Uh, while it was a bad day for Lou Michaels, the Jets' victory, arguably the most important win in NFL history, it put the AFL on par with the established league. The NFL had a hot property, the Super Bowl, and that would go on to become a national holiday, quasi-official holiday, and the most watched TV event of the year. January 5th, that's the key day because that is the day that Lou Michaels and Joe Namath would meet in that Fort Lauderdale bar and lay the foundation in turning the Super Bowl into a national obsession. And there's Pat Mahomes, who uh, won the 2020 Super Bowl last year with all the bells and whistles and gadgets and gizmos that weren't there in 1969. And the Lombardi Trophy, which Andy Reid is taking, uh, Vince Lombardi never won the Lombardi Trophy. Uh, he left Green Bay, sat out a year. Richard Nixon thought, hey, you know what? He should be my vice presidential candidate in 1968. Uh, and then he found out Lombardi was a Democrat, so that was off the table. Uh, he would come back in 1969 to coach Washington, got stomach cancer, and would die. And right after his death in 1970, they renamed the trophy. The Lombardi Trophy. One thing you might want to look up, uh, and I'm in a book called Lombardi's Left Side, written by a guy by the name of uh, Royce Broyles, um, and it's a story told to him by Herb Adderley and um, Dave Robinson. I'm quoted in that book. Uh, what you might want to know about Lombardi, uh, he was a civil rights pioneer. By 1967, the Green Bay Packers football team had 13 black athletes, including Willie Davis, Willie Wood, Dave Robinson, Adderley, Bob Jeter. He also had gay players on his teams. He was a civil rights pioneer. That's the Queen Mary. About five, six years ago, uh, I speak on cruise ships, and that Prince's cruise ship behind the Queen Mary. Uh, I was speaking on that. We're doing a California run, and uh, I got to go on the Queen Mary. Now, the Queen Mary is important in Super Bowl law because... Uh, the Super Bowl took on a new personality after Super Bowl VII. 
Uh, that would be in January of 1973. It was a party on the Queen Mary, and anybody who is anybody in Hollywood was the, at that party, including Dean Martin and others. Word leaks out about the party, and all of a sudden people say, well, we don't need Dean Martin at our party. We can have our own party. And thus, the Super Bowl party starts. Party time. Well, uh, under normal circumstances without COVID, you might want to see the chips and, and the burgers and, and the wings. John Madden would uh, enjoy that party. I worked with John for 15 years because his favorite sandwich was mustard and ketchup on rye. Uh, so he would have plenty of that, of course. Uh, party time. Every community in America is touched by the Super Bowl as stores sell big screen TVs under normal circumstances not in the COVID year. Supermarkets have super sales in the Beer Institute. Yes, there really is a Beer Institute. Uh, I went out to lunch once with Lori Levy, who explained what the Beer Institute was for me and talked about the Super Bowl there. Uh, the Beer Institute pointed out just how big a party day the Super Bowl is, second biggest consumption day of the year under normal circumstances behind. Thanksgiving. Oh, big screen TVs. Yeah, the big screen TVs go the week or two before the Super Bowl. It's a two-week period between the championship games and the Super Bowl. Uh, generally, a 500% increase during Super Bowl week. The event increases demand for television sets to watch the big game. Super Bowl is a trademark name. The big game the NFL tried to trademark and they were laughed out of court. So many big games all over the place. Beer here, beer here. The Beer Institute has data that suggests the Super Bowl, depending on the year, is one of the seven biggest sales days of the year behind Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, and the 4th of July. Uh, whatever is left of newspapers, they have special advertising sections, again, not in the COVID year, for uh, the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is a moneymaker for supermarkets, department stores, bars, snack food makers, breweries, and restaurants. It is also the springboard for companies to start their annual TV, radio, and print advertising campaigns, and for TV networks that have the game. A show that uh, is new or a show they really want to promote, they slot it in after the Super Bowl because they're still viewers that could sample that show. Uh, in 2020, and I'll use 2020 because 2021 doesn't exist in terms of this because of COVID, but last year, average cost of a ticket for the past five Super Bowls, 5706. Uh, the average cost for a 30 second commercial, this could change this year, $5.6 million. There may be more viewers because of COVID and with people not having anything to do. That's more than doubled in 12 years. 1.4 billion chicken wings will be eaten during the Super Bowl weekend. Uh, at least 11.2 million pounds of chips, 11 million pounds of guacamole, and 10 million pounds of ribs. That was the estimate for 2020. Uh, in 2020, survey said, one in two, it's not family feud, survey said people would sacrifice, one in two people would sacrifice their vacation days for one year to watch their team win the Super Bowl. More than one in three would give up their annual bonus. I wouldn't. 22.7 million people in 2020 were projected uh, to likely bet on the Super Bowl legally. And that would be more than $325 million uh, on that event. There will be more this year because there are more states, 25 of them, that will be around and the District of Columbia uh, legal betting uh, in the United States. Joe Namath, of course, the hero of the Super Bowl, uh, was part of the commercials in the Super Bowl, the pantyhose commercial. He wore pantyhose, made him feel good uh, underneath his jersey. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, Medicare is over. Uh, you had to sign up for Medicare, but that's what Joe is doing now. And he was happy he called. Uh, Super Bowl commercials, the actual game begins, may take second or third place as a news event to commercials and parties. The NFL or the halftime show. NFL attempts to draw non-football fans to the TV. Rating the commercials has become a major part of the entertainment package, like this commercial from the late 1970s. Mean Joe Green of the Pittsburgh Steelers and the kid, the Coca-Cola commercial in a stadium that was just recently knocked down in Mount Vernon, New York, where they did this commercial. Some of the best of the commercials, Mean Joe Green, Coke. 
Apple, sledgehammer. Pepsi, Coke guy takes Pepsi. Tabasco sauce, mosquito. 1988, or rather 1998, 3D Doritos. 2003, Budweiser Clydesdale. 2003, Terry Tate, office linebacker. And uh, in 2010, Betty White. Betty White continuing into the uh, new decade, the Snickers commercial. The Arizona problem, 1988. Welcome to uh, Sun Devil Stadium, the Phoenix Cardinals, after uh, 28 years in uh, St. Louis. The politics of the game. NFL owners awarded Bill Bidwell's Phoenix Cardinals a 1993 Super Bowl in an effort to boost sagging attendance in Tempe, Arizona, where the stadium was, right outside of Phoenix, in March of 1990. But there was a problem. The governor, Arizona Governor Evan Meacham, canceled the Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday in 1987 after uh, Arizona said yes to it after Ronald Reagan made it a national holiday in 1986. Bidwell took his team to Tempe in 1988. Martin Luther King and the big game. Well, because the uh, Martin Luther King Day was rescinded, uh, the performer, Stevie Wonder, announced that he would boycott performing in Arizona, and others said the same. And the convention planners said they're going to bypass Arizona. The battle was on. Uh, in 1989, it's not an NFL problem yet. The state legislature passed the legislation to create a state holiday honoring King, but opponents managed to get enough signatures to get voters in the state to decide whether or not they should honor King in a vote in November of 1990. NFL said, uh, vote yes, you have that Super Bowl in 1993. Vote no, it's gone. Well, the no's win, and there is no holiday, and the NFL said, uh, you're gone, but let, let, let's, let's do this. You're gone in 1993, but, but if you come in 1992, presidential election year, if you say yes to the big game, uh, we will give you the next available big game Super Bowl, which would be in 1996. Arizona voters said yes. The NFL, uh, three months later, said yes in its promise to Tempe and gave the game to Tempe in 1996. The anthem. The anthem's a big deal now. Um, really big deal. Big time performers perform the anthem. And the biggest deal was during the Iraq Gulf War back in 1990 91 uh, in the Tampa Super Bowl, New York Giants, Buffalo Bills. Uh, Whitney Houston performed that anthem, and there was some debate whether it was live or on tape. But I went to the horse's mouth and got the explanation about that national anthem. A guy by the name of Jim Steak, who ran big events for the National Football League, who I've known for years. In early January, our coordinator of Super Bowl pregame activities, Bob Best, produced a recording of the Florida Orchestra for national anthem producer Ricky Minor. A week later, Minor flew to Los Angeles to have Whitney record the vocal track. Amazingly, it was done in one take. It was on tape. Uh, the anthem, a uh, big deal. Also, halftime shows a big deal. And this is probably the biggest deal of all, the Justin Timberlake. Uh, Janet Jackson 2004 halftime show. Now it's fading into memory. It's going to be 17 years now. But for a while, it was the most talked about halftime show ever. Uh, Janet Jackson's costume malfunction at halftime of the 2004 game caused the political football and changed how TV and radio presented programming. Oddly enough, the ABC network showing of Saving Private Ryan is highly impacted by a Super Bowl halftime show. Because after costume malfunction, uh, after the Super Bowl incident, Michael Powell, who is the head of the FCC, three Republicans, two Democrats, five people on the FCC, is always like that. The party in power has the majority on the FCC. Michael Powell, son of Colin Powell, dug in and started going after other areas of indecency. By October 2004, Powell and the FCC colleagues started thinking whether or not a hockey game that featured fights was suitable programming between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. daily. Uh, you have football where there's a fight in every play, but uh, I guess that doesn't count uh, because football is football. 
hockey's you know, canon. Uh, the FCC acts. Uh, Justin Timberlake grabbed Jackson in the dance routine and accidentally forced her dress to open, which revealed one of her breasts. That 916th of a second, 916th of a second left an impression. Politicians derided CBS and CBS's MTV unit, which produced the halftime show. Within 15 hours, politicians gathered on the steps in front of the Capitol in Washington, pointing a finger, a finger of blame at Janet Jackson in CBS, oddly enough, never for Justin Timberlake. Justin Timberlake was unscathed in this whole thing. It was Janet Jackson, CBS, MTV, Viacom for promoting something immoral not Justin Timberlake. The hammer came down on CBS, the Republican-led FCC majority, got involved. They fined Viacom CBS $550,000, changed in decency rules. Uh, Viacom CBS would fight the fines for seven years and eventually would win. Saving Private Ryan won a lot of Oscars when it came out in the late 1990s. Tom Hanks was in it, Edward Burns, Matt Damon, Tom Sizemore, Steven Spielberg film. The FCC raised the amount stations and networks could be docked for what could be termed questionable images and dirty words. 2004, television stations were scared off by the prospect of fines. 66 ABC, Disney, Disney owned ABC TV affiliates, mostly in the southern United States, did not show the movie Saving Private Ryan because of foul language concerns. The TV stations didn't want to risk a fine. Saving Private Ryan had won five Academy Awards. Following the 1998 release, it had aired on ABC in 2001 and 2002. Military veterans groups were furious with the stations. Disney, ABC said, we'll pay your fines if you're going to get fined. Uh, and the station said no. Um, the, the show had been aired, or the movie had been aired twice before, 2001, 2002. There was one complaint in 2000 because of, 2002 because of foul language. The FCC ignored it. It was a clean movie. They just didn't want to show it for fear of fine. So the halftime act would become a safe act, like Paul McCartney, who spent nine days in the Tokyo jail in 1980 because he was busted for marijuana, but he was safe. Uh, and then the Rolling Stones, and you see Ronnie Wood on the left, Mick in the middle, and Keith Richards, need I say any more. And the Who, two members of the Who died from drug-related incidences. Uh, Keith Boom, the drummer back in 1978, um, mixed some drugs, uh, prescription drugs at that, and died. Uh, John Entwistle, the bass player, uh, had a cocaine overdose. Uh, but Roger Daughtry and then Pete Townsend are still around, and behind Pete is uh, Ringo Starr's son, the Who. It's more than a game, halftime shows. Uh, some of the people who performed there, Mariah Carey, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Justin Timberlake came back. He came back after the Janet uh, Jackson incident about 14 years later. Beyonce, uh, Janet Jackson, McCartney, The Stones, The Who, Whitney Houston, Lady Gaga, have all been part of either the pregame show or the halftime ceremonies. It will be Tampa in 2021, Inglewood 2022, Glendale 2023. Uh, right now, New Orleans is gonna go in 2025 uh, instead of 2024 because even the NFL knows the Mardi Gras is bigger than the Super Bowl. Mardi Gras is bigger than the Super Bowl and the dates uh, collide for Mardi Gras and the Super Bowl. That's been kicked back a year. Uh, the Orange Bowl is gone. Uh, that's my wife on the uh, field in the Orange Bowl back in 1982, gone. Been replaced by a baseball stadium for the Miami Marlins. Uh, the event, well, the NFL isn't putting it out for bids. They're just calling communities. Hey, you interested? Yeah, this is what it's gonna take. Uh, and that's how they select the Super Bowl. Uh, February, the Super Bowl is always in February now because it's one of three major waiting periods for networks and the networks that, or the network that gets the Super Bowl wins the rating suite, which means for the next couple months afterwards, they can charge higher rates for commercials and make more money. Uh, the future of the Super Bowl, the NFL's claim that it might attempt to globalize it 
by putting it in London. I can't see Congress sitting there and saying, yeah, go ahead, take it to London. Congress has made the National Football League with 61 uh, Sports Broadcast Act, also the 66 merger, the 84 Cable TV Act, and the uh, 86 Tax Code uh, refinements all have put money into the NFL. NFL has embraced Las Vegas after years of being against legalized gambling. Uh, Las Vegas will be a Super Bowl host contender. Just a few years ago, the NFL turned down uh, television money for the Super Bowl from the Las Vegas Visitors and Convention Center Commission. They didn't want gambling to get involved with the Super Bowl. Uh, Super Bowl 2017, Houston hosted the Super Bowl. Channel 13 in Houston wanted to see how much money the Super Bowl was really worth. Uh, the Super Bowl people, the proponents say it's worth more than $300 million in economic impact. So in 2017, Channel 13 in Houston asked the question, how much public funding was going into the NFL's week-long party? The answer, $26 million from Harris County and Texas, Texas taxpayers, according to Channel 13. Uh, another loss, uh, Arizona had the Super Bowl back in 2015, 2008. In 2014, the mayor of Glendale, still the mayor of Glendale, Arizona, Jerry Weyer, said Glendale would lose money on the event. Mayor Weyer told an interviewer from ESPN, the magazine, that I totally believe we will lose money on this. Weyer's claimed that Glendale lost a million dollars on the 2008 game. Although the Arizona Cardinals owner, Michael Bidwell, said we gave you $13 million of free advertising. Glendale, you could see the NHL's Coyotes. You could see Major League Baseball preseason, the White Sox and the Dodgers. And you could see Arizona Cardinal games and also the Fiesta Bowl. Other than that, there's no reason to go to Glendale, Arizona, unless you want to go to the Westgate Mall. Uh, Glendale's numbers, backed up by Wires, who was not the city mayor in 2008. Glendale spent $3 million in city services on the game, got back slightly more than a million dollars in taxes uh, from various spending at places, including hotels, motels, restaurants, and car agencies. Indianapolis at the Super Bowl about seven, eight years ago, also reported a million dollar loss, but hey, Indianapolis got free publicity. Fans do come with money, though. They do come with money, and they spend it, but it doesn't go into the community. Some Super Bowl goers do spend money at hotels, motels, car rental agencies, but if those places aren't owned locally, Super Bowl rate hikes at those places, they don't stay in the host city. They go back to the home office, which is somewhere else. Same with restaurants. Yeah, some people... Taxi drivers, people who clean hotel, motel rooms, parking lot attendants, waiters and waitresses might get a bit more tip money, but a good chunk of Super Bowl spending does not end up in the non-hospitality businesses in the area. State officials estimated Minnesota lost $9 million in taxes because of breaks given to the NFL in 2018 for the Super Bowl. Local communities lost $2 million in taxes. Atlanta, 2019. Hotel rooms for eight nights for each participating team, including 150 standard rooms, two presidential suites, five other suites. Oh yeah, not only that, um, the NFL didn't pay for rent at the stadium. Uh, also, the host committee assignment the 10 security officers to each team's hotel during the day, five at night. Police escorts for team owners, all of them who were there, to and from the game. Petrie Street, Petrie Place. Atlanta. 10,000 parking spaces for game use with the NFL retaining uh, the parking revenue. A wide range of lesser items such as installing up to 2,000 banners on street poles, setting up social media monitoring and a response center all on Atlanta's dime. And in Atlanta you could go see the Martin Luther King Center but you're not gonna do that necessarily because the NFL wants you to go to FanFest where you'll drop money into NFL owners' pockets. Uh, the NFL will retain all revenue from ticket sales. Even the host committee has to buy its tickets, 750 of them at face value. $10 million was the estimated value to the NFL of a sales tax exemption on Super Bowl tickets passed by the Georgia legislature that year. 
NFL, uh, the Atlanta Bid Committee, uh, agreed to an NFL requirement that the host committee reimburse the league and its teams for any other state or local taxes they pay in connection with the Super Bowl. Enhancements included $2 million contribution for use towards certain NFL expenses related to the game, possible million-dollar contribution to complement state and city efforts in the event of inclement weather. A party for people like me. I need to go to a party, right? I need to go to a party. I didn't go to the party. I got to go to the party, so. A party for 2,000 media members at a cost of $375,000 picked up by the bid committee and a pledge to provide NFL owners with private VIP airport accommodations. Super Bowl, last February in Atlanta, Super Bowl 54, Miami-Dade tax, Miami County taxpayers gave the Miami Dolphins owner Stephen Ross $4 million for snagging the game. And there was $10 million cost for game expenses, including police protection and other services. Oh yeah, the NFL decided they were gonna help upgrade two public parks, $3 million for that, but we'll give you some money. $850,000. The NFL, they make money off the Super Bowl. Super Bowl is a national holiday. Uh, for many people, they take the Monday off after the game. There has been some who say, make it a national holiday. There are some who say, just back it into uh, the uh, presidential weekend where that Monday, it's the third Monday of uh, every February uh, is, a holiday, so you can take care of that. Super Bowl, created by an act of Congress, signed into law by Lyndon Johnson. Super Bowl is a remnant of the Jim Crow days prior to the Civil Rights uh, Act in 1964. Um, the Super Bowl has more history than just a game. The Super Bowl is more than just a game. Thank you, Allie, for inviting me. Thank you uh, to the uh, patrons at the Seishim Library. Thank you to Anne-Marie for uh, what you have done uh, for me in the past year. My name is Evan Wiener. Uh, enjoy the Super Bowl this year. Bye-bye for now.